Hey everyone, it's your stats teacher, Mr. Boyden, back at it again. Today we're going to be looking at more chi-squared tests, specifically um, what happens when you have a two-way table. Um, we're going to be looking today at tests of homogeneity and independence. So to begin, let's review really quickly what we looked at last time. Um, last time we looked at chi-squared goodness of fit, often called GOF, that's what it's called in the Inspire calculator. Um, and last time it was comparing if a distribution of something was the same as the claim distribution or whether it was different. And so we had the hypotheses for the null that the distribution is the same and for the alternative hypothesis, the distribution is not the same. And then we had a couple different ways of wording that that we saw in the previous video. Um, today's are gonna be a little different. They're still gonna be worded though. Um, here are the basic things I want you to know about the tests for homogeneity and independence before we actually go and do them. Number one, both of them are used on a two-way table and matrix. And for that reason, everything in the calculator is the same. Now it is gonna be different than for goodness of fit because we were using lists of data for goodness of fit. They weren't actually tables. Um, when we put them in as a table, the data are um, sort of paired up in the right way then. Okay, what else? Um, the conditions are very similar to what we already know. Um, they still have to have randomness of the sampling or the ex experimental assignment, whatever it is. Um, we'll be using the 10% condition, but only if we did sampling without replacement. So um, not too commonly. Um, and we're still gonna have the large counts condition as well. It's still gonna be the case that the expected counts have to be at least five. And so that is the same um, as goodness of fit. However, the way that we calculate the counts is different when we have a two-way table. And we've got that right down here. And so um, if you haven't started taking notes yet, you probably want to start now um, right down here because this is a little bit different. And this is how we calculate the expected count for a two-way table. And we have to do it cell by cell. So it's going to take a minute. It's going to take a little bit longer than all the previous ones did. Um, or all the previous techniques. And what we do is we take the row total for that cell, the column total for that cell, and the table total, and we put them in, multiply and then divide, and there you go. Degrees of freedom, we're still gonna calculate it. Because we have a table, all you're gonna do is take the number of columns, less one, and the number of rows, less one, and multiply those together. So today we're gonna see examples of all of those, including the specific way that we write the hypotheses. This is another one of those situations where um, with a little bit of study, you're gonna be really successful on these. It's not something that um, you can kind of fake your way through, um, but with just a little bit of studying, and a little bit of practice, you can learn the correct way these are formatted and you can score very well. So let's take a look at homogeneity first. Homogeneity, or the test for homogeneity, is used when we have one variable and two populations or two treatments. And so what that means is we're gonna have two samples. And I would write that down, that homogeneity is gonna be used when we have two different samples because that's gonna be the distinguishing factor between homogeneity and independence. Now, how do the hypotheses work? The null is no difference. And the alternative is that there is a difference. So in the example we have here, and this is um, in general form, I guess, for the, for the null, we have no difference in the distribution of whatever the variable is for several populations or treatments. And the alternative, same thing, but there is um, a difference in the distributions. If you have trouble remembering which is which, remember that the null hypothesis, you, we never accept it. We could fail to reject. And when we fail to reject, we're saying, well, we don't really have strong evidence of anything. So if we had a situation where we failed to reject, that would be saying, well, I guess we can, we can go with there being no difference. We don't know there is a difference. So really what we're looking for here is evidence of a difference. And that's why the difference is in the alternative hypothesis. All right, so let's do an example. Every year, Mrs. Gaius surveys a random sample of 50 seniors at her large high school to find out what career they intend to pursue after high school. She wonders if the distribution of intended career choice has changed over the last five years. The two-way table summarizes the data from the two samples. All right, so pause. They told us right there there's two samples. Notice, there's nowhere in this question that it says if it's homogeneity or independence. But the fact that there's two samples lines up with exactly what we just saw up here where you have two samples. And what we're seeing is if we have homogeneity between those two samples, so if they are effectively the same or if they are different. 
So we're looking for evidence of a difference in the two. And so we've got our table, and we're asked to state the appropriate null and alternative hypotheses. We're going to practice showing how you calculate the expected counts, and we're going to leave that in table form. And then we'll run through the logistics on the calculator. So by the end of this example, um, I think you'll have a pretty good feel of how these work. Let's write out the hypotheses for this situation. So remember, the null hypothesis is going to talk about there being no difference. So we would say there is no difference between the true distributions of the intended careers of the classes of 2012 and of 2017. And let's be specific. That's since all of the data were taken from the school that Ms. Gaius is at, uh, we need to say between the classes of 27, 2012 and 2017 at the school or for seniors, uh, I guess we have that we said the class of 2012, so I guess it's implied that it's seniors. So at the school Mrs. Gaius works at. Now the alternative, it's the exact same thing, so I'm going to copy and paste this down, except there is a difference. Okay, and that's it. So we've got our hypotheses. Not too bad, kind of a fill in the blank style. Now let's discuss part B. We need to show the calculation for the expected count in the arts and humanities in the 2012 cell, then provide a complete table. Before we do this, I do want to remind you that the way we find the expected counts is right here. Okay, expected count for any cell, and it should say if it's for any individual cell, is the row total times the column total for that cell divided by the total of the table. Let's walk through the mechanics. It's actually not very hard. It takes just a minute. Um, you may wish to have a calculator in front of you for this. So they asked us to do the Arts and Humanities 2012 cell. So I'm going to show that work um, right up here. All right, so the cell we're talking about right now is this one. So we need the row total. So row total, 32. So that would be 32 divided by the column total. Down here we can see the column total is 50. So I should have extended that, I guess. 32 times 50 divided by the table total. So we're using these three numbers. So we've got the row total, column total, and then table, table total, excuse me. And that's going to be the expected count. Um, that comes out to be 16. Now, guys, I'm not doing that in my head. I mean, I guess, well, although I guess you could. Um, I'm not doing that in my head. I'm typing it in a calculator. So that's how you find the expected count for any one cell. So what we would do then on a free response question, we'll be expected to demonstrate this in tabular form. So maybe I'll go like this. I'll come over here and I'll say expected counts. Um, and just to save you having to look at too much of my handwriting, I'm just going to go like this and we're going to have all of our counts in this little array right here. Okay. And um, I'm going to talk through it as I go, but I'm not going to show all the work. By the way, you would not be expected to show all the work on an actual exam. So we already know the first count right here is 16. What about for this cell? So what I'm going to type in, the row total is the same. So that's 32, but the column total down here, actually it's a different column, but still the same. So guess what? It has the same count if the row total and column total are the same. Let's come to social sciences. So I'm looking right here now. So I have my row total and column total 26 and 50. So 26 times 50. And we're dividing by 100. Every time we'll divide by 100 because that's the total of the table. So when I do that, I get 13 here. Oh, excuse me, I forgot to divide by 100. Nope, there it is, 13. Okay, and if that was 13, this is the same, it's still 26 and 50. So that's also going to be 13. Let's come down to the next one for STEM. So I've got 30 times 50, divide by 100, and that's 15. So 15, which means that this one is going to be 30 come down to here and my row and column total 12 times 50 divided by 100 that's 6 and I'll come to this one and that's going to be uh, 12 times 50 so same thing that's also going to be 6 and actually you know what I'm wondering if maybe I made a mistake right here I'm going to double check that one I think I've made a mistake in my table so let's go back um, that is the cell that is right 
here. So if I want to calculate that, I should be using 30 and 50 over 100. So let's double check that because something doesn't feel right. And sure enough, that number should have been 15. So that was a mistake. I think I made a, a mental error on my calculation. Now, if you notice, the left and right of this table are the same. That's a coincidence. It's And it's happening because these two column totals were the same. Um, sometimes that'll happen, but not always. Now, why did we have to do this? The whole purpose of doing this is to see if we satisfied the large counts condition. And we said earlier that if we we're going to satisfy the large counts condition, all the expected counts would need to be five or larger. And so we have a table right here that demonstrates that we've met that. So now let's go to part C. We're going to calculate the value of the chi-squared test statistic. And actually, we're going to do a little bit more than that because we already stand, understand statistical inference. So now I'm going to show you what we need to do in the calculator in order to complete this calculation. In our calculator, let's start on the home screen. This is going to be a little bit different. We're going to start a new document. One of the issues we have is this is not two lists that we're working on in this question. It's actually one table. And so we have to enter a table. Now, the way you do that in the Inspire is you go to a calculator. And actually, really quickly, let's go look at the test on this. And this will give you a clue. That way, if you ever forget it, you can figure out how to remember. It says a chi-squared two-way test. And when you go into this, it's going to ask you what matrix you're talking about. So what we'll need to do is make a matrix. The way that works, hit the menu button. Notice that number seven is matrix and vector. And we're going to create our matrix. Now to do this, they're going to ask us how many rows and how many columns we have. So I'm looking back at the question and there were two columns and four rows. So I'm going to switch that to four. And now it's going to give us this matrix. And so I'm going to take a minute and type in the values. So 22, 13, 10, 5. If this is going too fast, please pause the video so that you have a chance to type this in with me. Because I do want you to hit the buttons. Because as you go through this, it is important that you hit the buttons. That's how you're going to generate memories of this. Otherwise, you may not be able to remember it later. So double checking. Make sure that that's accurate. Looks pretty good from here. Now, here's where it gets weird. You remember how when we would do lists of data, you had to name them? And if you didn't name them, then you couldn't do inference because your calculator can't reference them. You have to do that here. But the way we do it, we have to hit the control button and then var is right above that is STO. And I don't, I'm guessing that means storage. And it, what it does, it's going to store it in the memory. So now we can write the name of this. So I'm going to write Gaius. It's uh, the data that she took. And I'm going to hit enter. And over here, it's just basically confirming, like, roger that, reading you loud and clear. So now we're ready to perform the inference test. And this is where in the beginning of the video, I said that whether it's homogeneity or independence, the test is the same. So let's run the test. Menu, statistics, stats tests. And we have chi-squared, two-way test. And again, it doesn't know if it's homogeneity or if it's independence. Calculation is the same. The interpretation is just different. So the observed matrix, and there it is. That's the one I just typed in. So there's my observed matrix. Let's hit OK. And it gives us this sort of inferency looking output. So we were asked for the chi-squared statistic. There it is. And our p-value. Let's remember for a minute what these would mean in context. So let's go back over to OneNote and let's draw this out so we can actually see it. And you're going to have to be very patient with my drawing. Thank you very much for that, by the way. It's very kind of you. So what that means over here, if I try to draw this out, let's draw our chi-squared distribution. So vertical axis, there's the origin. A little bit of a right skew. What this is saying is that somewhere over here, we have a value of 8.17. And I'm rounding, of course. And we have some shaded area, which is our p-value, which is equal to, I'm going to round that one to 0.04. So what does that mean? The way we interpret the p-value is the exact same way we would have for any other sort of statistical test. We'd say that seems small enough, and they didn't tell us what the significance level was for alpha. So we're going to say it's 0.5 or 0.05, excuse me. So we would say this is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, which means that we do have evidence that there is 
a difference between the true distributions of intended careers of the class of 2012 and of 2017. And where do we see that? It looks like a lot of a lot fewer students in 2017 are looking at arts and humanities and more students are looking at STEM, which kind of makes sense with the way things are changing over time. So that's an example of how we run a test of chi-squared for homogeneity. Let's talk about how we run a test for chi-squared for independence. Now, again, all the mechanics are the same. There's just one difference, okay? In this case, it's gonna be used when we have one sample or one population, and we're gonna be looking at two variables. Now, one way you could remember this, or I should say the way that I remember it is, when we talk about independence in math, normally we're talking about like independent, dependent variable, independent events, things like that. Independence to me almost seems to imply that there have to be two variables. So you're looking at one group of people or one group of whatever the population is referencing and you're comparing to see if the two variables within that population are independent or, or not. Okay, and or if you could say if they're associated. So down below we have what we normally would state for the null and alternative hypotheses and it's very similar to homogeneity. With the null, we're saying there's not an association, and here we have a real world example. So not an association between anger level and heart disease status in the population of people with normal blood pressure. And for the alternative, we have that there is an association, okay? So that's the same as like saying there's no difference, there is a difference. Now, another thing to notice, we said this would work for two variables in one population. Look at the formatting of the hypotheses. So it says no, there is no association between variable number one, variable number two, okay, so two variables, and the population of people with normal blood pressure, population. So the literally like the alternative and null hypotheses are formatted in the same way as how we know when to use this test. Two variables, one population, name the variables that you're, that you're trying to identify an association or dependent relationship between, and then name the population that you're talking about. So here's an example. Mark Zuckerberg wants to know if there's an association between age group and Facebook use among US adults. Facebook conducts a random sample of 250 US adults and records their age and whether or not they use Facebook. The table summarizes the results. Okay, so let's look at the results for just a second, see if we notice anything interesting. Okay, looks like more Facebook users than not, 250 people. And what else do we notice? Wow, if you're 18 to 29, you're pretty likely to use Facebook. Actually, it looks like in all of the age groups, you're more likely than not. So we're gonna try to figure out um, if the data provide convincing evidence of an association between the age group that you're in and whether or not you use Facebook. And we're doing that for US adults. This is a classic sort of free response question for AP um, and the exact type of question that we're able to answer with a test for independence. So what that tells us is this is going to be a state plan do interpret. And so let's write that out. Step one, let's name some hypotheses. So we'll start with a null hypothesis. And so we said that the null would talk about saying that there is not an association. So our null is going to be there is no association. Oops, let me switch out of my font mode here. Sorry about that. There is no association between, and what were the two variables? They're actually gonna be listed right here in the table. Okay, so those are typically gonna be spoon fed right to us. So how do we wanna say those? There is no association between age group and whether or not someone uses Facebook for all US adults. Okay, now that follows the exact pattern that we saw when we wrote down the example above. I've named um, variable one, so age group, variable two, Facebook use status, and also the population, the population is US adults. That's the null, let's write the alternative. So let's do a full on copy paste for that. Obviously you're gonna write this out by hand in your notes, or if you're on an actual test, you're not gonna have the luxury of copy and paste, um, at least not this year, maybe in the future, who knows? So, um, Oops, sorry, so alternative, 
and there is, and then the only difference is, there is an association. So there is no association, there is an association between age group and whether or not someone uses Facebook for all U.S. adults. Um, what are we missing for the state? We're also going to name alpha. They didn't tell us alpha, and so alpha is 0 0.05. All right, that's the state. Let's do a plan. For a plan, we need to name the test type, and this is a chi-squared test. Oops, wrong. This is a chi-squared test. Oops. Now you can't just say chi-squared test. You have to say which ones. You have to say if it's goodness of fit, homogeneity, or independence. Here we're dealing with multiple variables. So this is a test for independence. And then we need to check out our conditions. So our conditions are The random condition, um, they said in the wording it is a random sample of 250 U.S. adults. Random, oops, wow, I seem to be struggling to spell today. Random sample of U.S. adults, awesome. Do we need to do the 10% condition? Let's see, are we sampling without replacement? So a random sample of 250 U.S. adults and records their age. Mm, doesn't really say, so better safe than sorry. Let's include it. So 10% condition. Um, and also, by the way, the, um, the resource that I'm pulling this question from does include the 10% condition. Um, so we had, we could test that, 250 people is less than 10% um, of all U.S. adults. And we named the population there. And number three, large counts condition. And this is where we need to make a table. So I'm building myself, buying, trying to buy myself a little space here. And let's make a table. So I'm going to zoom out so I can still see what's going on here. And so it looks like this is going to be four wide and two up and down. So let's draw in a table down here. All right, so we got our four there, and let's start filling in these numbers. So remember, row total and column total. I'm going to talk these out loud as I go through them, but I'm not going to demonstrate the work. So I'm starting with, yes, 18 to 29. So that's 191 times 68 divided by 250. And that's 51.95. So 51.95. Let's just work our way to the right. So 191 times 84 divided by 250 that's 64.2 guys okay, there's no significance to how i'm rounding these remember all we're trying to show is if these are greater than five so i'm rounding this to a fewer number of digits just so i have enough space for it so 0.2 let's keep working to the right 191 times 68 hey we already did that one so that's going to be the same as the first space so 51.95 we're going to go to the next one. That's going to be 191 times 30 divided by 250. That's 22.9. And then let's keep going. So we're going to go down to row 2 now and keep, keep working on it. So that's 191, excuse me, 59 times 68 divided by 250. Nope, got to type that in again. 59 times 68 divided by 250. And I'm getting 16.0 when I do that. So 16.0.0. Sorry about that, guys. And then let's keep working to the right. 59 times 84 divided by 250. I'm getting 19.8. Further to the right, 59 times 68. We've already done that one. That's 16.0. And then the very last one, 59 times 30 over 250, that's 7.1. So let's go back up here. Let's write something about this. So this was a table of expected counts. Oh, it doesn't want to move it now, does it? So table of expected counts shows all values are greater 
than 5. So we've met the large counts condition. All right, state plan, let's go to do. And we're going to need to actually pull up the calculator and do this one now. So let's pull up the calculator. Here we go. We're going to need to make a matrix. Create a matrix. This one only had two rows, but it had four columns. So let's put that in now. All right, and we'll input our data. So 68, 64, and 20, 46, and 22, 21, and 9. If you're not ready to continue, please pause the video so you have a chance to type this in as well. I do want you to type it in with me so that you can actually learn it. And I'm going to call that, uh, I don't know, Facebook. And it doesn't matter, it just needs to be something you can reference. Let's go run the test. Menu, stats, stat test, chi-squared, two-way test. What is our matrix? It was the Facebook matrix. And so there we have all of our information. So um, what I think I'll do is um, I could do a screenshot. I think I'll just write this stuff back on the screen so it looks more like what you would see on an actual test. And when I mean test, I don't mean statistical test. I mean like a school exam. So let's go back over to here. State plan do. What information do we need for the do? We need. Let's write that stuff down. So we had the chi-squared value. Oops. Chi-squared was equal to 8.856. We had our p-value, and that was equal to 0 0.031. Another good thing to include here, and we want to practice it anyway, is the degrees of freedom. Now, the degrees of freedom, remember, that was the number of rows, and we saw, let's go back up so we can see it. That was the number of columns minus one and the number of rows minus one. So how many columns and rows did we have? We had four rows and two columns. So four, four and two would become three and one. Three times one is three. So the degrees of freedom on this is three. If we wanted to show our work on that, we would show that's because we did three minus one, or excuse me, four minus one times two minus one. And then it's also not a bad idea to include a quick sketch on here. So quick sketch, so skew to the right, 0 0.031, shaded area, that's our p-value. Oh, except I put the chi-squared statistic on the axis, that wasn't right. So p-value, 0 0.031, chi-squared 8.856 right here. So that's all done. And let's interpret. So that p-value seems small enough. Since the p-value of 0 .0 0.031 is less than alpha, which is 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. You can write that out symbolically as h sub zero if you prefer. There is convincing evidence of an association between age group and whether someone uses Facebook or not. Okay, so um, all that oh, for the population of US adults. Don't forget that last part because we aren't talking about worldwide, we're just talking about US adults in this example. Okay, so what does that tell us? It means that depending on your age, you may have different Facebook use. Okay, and that's what this test um, has allowed us to conclude. As I hope you can see, um, the mechanics of these tests are not so bad. Yeah, you got to practice in the Inspire and make sure you're really comfortable with that. Um, it's not that hard to recognize a chi squared test because a t test and a z test wouldn't work. Um, and so that's kind of a giveaway that it's probably a chi-squared test. 
the only thing you'd have to be able to do still is you'd have to be able to recognize um, quickly and accurately whether it's a test for goodness of fit, for independence, or for homogeneity. And so that's what we're going to do here. I've got three examples on the screen now. Um, and so you may want to pause the video here, read them for yourself, and try to pick which type of chi-squared test is correct for each of these situations. And then I'm going to talk through them. Number one. Shopping at a secondhand store is becoming more popular and has even attracted the attention of business schools. A study of customers' attitude towards secondhand stores interviewed separate random samples. Pause, I already know what it is. Separate random samples. Do you know what it is? Which one had two different samples? That was the one where we talked about homogeneity. Homogeneity compares whether or not the two samples have the same distribution. So this is a test for homogeneity. Oops, homogeneity. Okay, uh, let's keep reading just to make sure that I'm right. Uh, two separate random samples of shoppers at two secondhand stores of the same chain in different cities. The two-way table shows the breakdown of respondents by gender. Yeah, so guys, the only variable here is gender. So you've got um, two samples, one at store A, one at store B, and the gender is the variable. Let's go to the next one. The general social survey asked random sample of adults their opinion about whether astrology is very scientific, sort of scientific, or not at all scientific. Here's a two-way table of counts for people in the sample, the sample, one sample, who had three levels of higher education. All right, so is that one sample? It looks like it. Are there two variables? Mm, looks like it. One variable is their opinion about astrology. The other variable is the degree held. So there's two different levels, or three levels for degree, two levels um, for opinion about astrology. So if there is one population and we have multiple variables, we're testing to see if those variables are independent or not. So this is a chi-squared test of independence. Let's look at the last one. Three, casinos are required to verify that their games operate as advertised. American roulette wheels have 38 slots, of which 18 are black, 18 are red, and two are green. In one casino, managers record the data from a random sample of 200 spins of one of their American roulette wheels. The table displays the results. Now notice the difference on this. This one is not a two-way table. This is just a simple table, one variable. And so it's neither homogeneity or independence. Now remember, in the Inspire, we have chi-squared goodness of fit, and we have chi-squared two-way test. So these first two examples, these are two-way tests. Be so because this is not a two-way test, and it's not about proportions, and it's not about means, it is about a distribution, that means this is a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Okay, so that's just a quick example of the differences between the three. Um, it is important that we can recognize those, and we want to be able to recognize them without too much effort. We need to get to a point where you're not sitting and thinking for 30 seconds or a minute trying to figure it out. Um, and I pointed out the things that made it really quick. A two-way table, it's homogeneity or independence. Then what you look for is how many samples and how many variables. If there's more than one variable, let's test the independence between the variables. If there's two samples, let's test the homogeneity of the two samples. If it's not a two-way test, but it's not a mean or a proportion, then it's goodness of fit. Let's try another example. For a class project, Abby and Mia wanted to know if the gender of an interview could affect the responses to a survey question. Looks like response bias, maybe. The subjects in their experiment were 100 males from their school. Half of the males were randomly assigned to be asked, would you vote for a female president by a female interviewer? The other half were asked the same question by a male interviewer. The table shows the results. Okay, so we see the results. We're going to state the appropriate null and alternative hypotheses. We're going to calculate the expected counts, and we're going to calculate chi-squared. And then I think, um, just for the sake of the video, because it's kind of lame if we don't answer the question, we're going to answer the question and say if we can... Um, reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So right now, I'd like you to pause the video and I want you to try this whole question on your own. Okay, let's see if you can get the whole thing without any help. Um, the first thing you'll have to do is um, figure out if it is goodness of fit, homogeneity, or independence. So identify that. That will tell you how to write the hypotheses. And then after that, I think you're going to do great on the rest. So pause the video now and give it a shot. Here we go. 
Um, your answers may vary just slightly from mine, and if they do, that's okay. Okay, so let's get the null hypothesis. So the null. Um, did you decide what kind of test this was? We have two variables, gender of interviewer and response to the question. So, um, and it looks like we have only one population. So we're going to be testing whether or not the variables are independent. So what we might say is for the null, there is no association between the gender of the interviewer, interviewer and the response to the question. And what was the question? Would you vote for a female president? For males at the school, the girls go to. Oops, go to. All right, and the alternative would be there is an association. Oops. There we go. All right, so that's for part A. Show the calculation for the expected counts in the male slash yes cell. All right, let's give that a shot. So they asked us to actually show the calculation. Male, yes. All right, so that calculation would be the row total. That's 69 multiplied by the column total, 50. And that would be over 100. So 69 times 50 divided by 100, that's 34.5. Let's make a table. So 34.5. This one turns out to be the same thing. 34.5. Let's go to male and no. So that would be 11 times 50 divided by 100. That's 5.5. Um, and then over here, same thing, 5.5. And then the last one, we have 20 and 50, so 20 times 50 divided by 100, and that's 10. Now, does that meet the large counts condition? Well, the wording in our textbook, which is written by um, two guys who have spent a lot of time in and around AP and how it's scored, the wording they use in the book is that all of the expected counts must be at least five. So that would tell us even if they were five, that's just fine. Yeah, this absolutely meets the large counts condition. Let's go and get the information for chi-squared. Right, so we're going to put in a matrix. And you should be starting to get a little bit more comfortable with this by now, I'm hoping. And looks like we have three rows, two columns. And so let's do our inputs. So 38, 12, 39 three and eight and then you can call it anything you want i think i'm going to call oops wrong spot i think i'm going to call mine voting voting enter so let's run our test menu statistics stats test two-way test and let's go down to voting and see what we get all right, p-value of 0.119, uh, or 0.12. All right, looks like we don't have convincing evidence. Okay, and the chi-squared was 4.2, I guess I'll call it 4.25. So back to the question. They asked for the value of the chi-squared test statistic. I think I had said that was 4.25, so let's go put that in. Chi-squared equals 4.25. That's kind of a weak effort at drawing chi, but oh well. Um, 4.25, and then we did not have enough evidence, or we did not have a p-value that allowed us to reject the null. So we are not able to say that we have evidence of an association between gender of interviewer and response to the question, would you vote for a female president? So what does that mean here? It means that for this, this exploration these girls did, they did not find a measurable or a meaningful uh, response bias by having a different gender um, interview the male respondents. Now let's, le let's end our learning today by looking at a question from an actual AP exam. Okay, and here it is. A parent advisory board for a certain university was concerned about the effect of part-time jobs on the ac academic achievement of students attending the university. To obtain some information, the board surveyed a simple random sample of 200 of the more than 20,000 students attending the university. Each student reported the average number of hours spent working part-time each week and his or her perception of the effect of part-time work on academic achievement. 
The data in the table below summarize the student's responses by average number of hours worked per week, whether that's less than 11, 11 to 20, or more than 20, and the perception of that effect on part-time work on academic achievement, whether it had positive, no effect, or a negative effect. A chi-squared test is used to determine if there's an association between the effect of part-time work on academic achievement and the average number of hours per week that students work. A computer output that resulted from the performing test is shown below. So I'm going to scroll down and show that now. This is an example where they actually give you all the stuff from the calculator so you wouldn't have to do it on your own. And so here it is. They ran a chi-squared test. They have expected counts printed below the observed counts. So the observed, I'm going to say, are probably the whole numbers. You would have whole number observations. The expected counts are these decimal numbers um, below them. Okay. They gave us the chi-squared test statistic. They gave us the number of degrees of freedom. And they gave us the p-value. And then there's four questions for us. We need to state the hypotheses, discuss the conditions for running chi-squared inference procedure, um, we have to look at the results of the chi-squared test and ask about the conclusion that's asking reject or fail to reject. And then based on the conclusion in C, we have to talk about what type of error we might have made. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video and try this one. Then we're going to look at how it we would be scored on an actual exam. All right, let's look at the answers now. We'll look at both the answers and the scoring because we need to get better at both. All right, for part A, check your hypotheses against these. And if it's not exactly the same, we're going to look at how it scores in just a minute. So for the null, there's no association between perceived effect of part-time work on academic achievement and average time spent on part-time jobs. There is an association is the alternative. Part B, they only have two conditions here, which surprised me a little bit, to be honest with you. Um, I thought they'd have the 10% condition because the text we're working out of says um, when you're sampling without replacement um, is when you need to use this. And I have no evidence that they sampled with replacement here. Um, so it may be that um, if this question were given today, I mean, this question is nine years old at the time of the making of this video. Maybe that would be different today, but I'm not sure. Okay, and the second condition, the expected cell count should be at least five. Um, you have to write something out and say something about it. You could say something like the smallest expected cell count is 6.825, which is greater than five. So the large counts condition is met. Okay, part C, because the p-value of 0 0.007, wow, that's small, is less than 0 0.05, the null should be rejected. There is convincing evidence that, and state the alternative hypothesis. And part D, because the null hypothesis was rejected, a type 1 error may have been made. I do want to remind you um, that a type 1 error is a false positive. Okay, and that's why that's appropriate here. We found evidence, positive evidence, so it's possible that it's false positive evidence. A type 1 error may have been made. A type 1 error is concluding that there is an association between the perceived effect of part-time work on academic achievement and average time spent on part-time jobs when... In reality, there is no association between the variables. Okay, so that's what AP says we should have answered on this. Let's go look at the scoring and make sure we know how to turn this, um, our responses into numbers. So here we go. Part A scores like this. You get an essentially correct if you have a statement of no association or independence and you have that in the null hypothesis and the statement of association in the alternative. So you have to have no association in the null and association in the hypothesis or in the uh, alternative two the hypotheses cannot imply a cause and effect relationship if you said that one causes the other you don't get this second mark for two and the third thing you have to use acceptable terms for the two variables so it's pretty easy just use the terms they gave in the question um, that helps a lot okay if you did all that then you get an e if you have two of those three things you get a p if you have less than two you get an i for that section let's look at part b you get an essentially correct if the response includes both conditions necessary for the test and indicates that both are met. Partially correct if only one of them is included and the response indicates the condition is met or both are stated but you do not indicate that both were met. Now, this last part really interests me and I don't know with the new iteration of the curriculum, I suspect this may have changed. Um, but they say down here in the note, if the response also includes conditions that are not required, you would read that as the 10% condition probably, for the chi-squared test, the response should be scored no higher for a P. Now, it could be something, 
what they might mean here, this might be a little bit open to interpretation, they might mean something like if you talked about the central limit theorem, um, that only applies to means, that doesn't apply to chi-squared, so that wouldn't make any sense at all if you were talking about um, the central limit theorem. I know you'd be marked down for that. The way this reads, it sounds like you might get marked down for putting the 10% condition in back in 2011, um, but it's not totally clear to me. Part C. That's essentially correct if the response includes a correct conclusion in context, which we've practiced a lot. I'm sure you're doing a great job of that by now. And it provides a justification based on the p-value and the conclusion. So um, we're already really good at that, guys. Since alpha, since the p-value relates to alpha in this way, we reject. We have evidence that blank. If you do that, you're always going to score on part C on these. And part D, it is a type. So you get an essentially correct if you said type 1 error. And if you described what that would mean in context, you, and you can't just say type 1. If all you say is type 1, you get a P. How does that turn into points? Um, every E you get is one point. Every P you get is half a point. And if it's between two, the grader is going to use a holistic approach. Um, so anytime you can, make it easier on your grader. Don't make them make a judgment on if you got a 2 or a 3, because that's a big difference. Okay. That's going to be all for today's video. Hope it's helpful, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, enjoy the practice, and let me know if you have any issues. And I'll see you next time.